All right. Good morning, everybody, and welcome to uh, Roby's PhD Defense. Uh, good to see everybody over here. Um, so we've, we've got people online, people who are online. Um, am I close enough that I can? I'm going to send you, I'm also going to send you my mobile number. Uh, so if something goes on, I should be monitoring things online, but something happens, feel free to call me. I'm going to send the mobile number via chat. Um, so Roby's been with us how long? Almost four years. Almost four years, right? It seems like oh, it, uh, counting undergraduate, it's been longer. Than it's been a long time. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah. In fact, we have to graduate because if you went all the way to May, you get tenure, right? So, um, <laughs> but the uh, but but Ruby's been working with us, uh, sponsored for uh, the most recent time uh, by an NSF fellowship, uh, and also spent some time out at NIST and so forth, looking at uh, sort of next generation controllers and a lot of interest uh, in that and. Uh, has actually got a good piece of work here. He's brought us hardware. We're going to see some good things going on. Uh, the rules uh, for the defense, uh, if you have questions of clarification, those are fine. We'll hold all the other questions until the end. Um, and then we'll go with audience questions. And then after audience questions, I think we're okay, unless the committee would like to close session, we'll, we'll just shift right into the committee uh, session. But I think people can stay. I know a number of you are not super close, but in the next couple of years, we'll be defending your own, so it's probably worthwhile to see what one of these things is like. So uh, feel free to stick around. But I also do understand that people have classes, so we might see people starting to disappear and so forth uh, as your classes start to roll up. So with that, I'll turn it over to Roby. Okay, thanks. So there are donuts at the back, and there's also coffee. Anybody is welcome to it. Also, I have written on the board links for the slides the handout, which is in front of you, and the video, which I'm going to show later. Uh, you guys can use the handout um, to look at some of the key diagrams that I'm going to be talking about. And if you want to grab the slides, you're welcome to do that. They're also in the chat window for those that are remote. So uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you for coming to my defense titled Direct Servo Control of Positional Derivatives for Five Axis CNC Machine Tools Using Densely Sampled Tool Paths. Uh, the theme of today's talk is smart manufacturing, so I want everybody to keep in mind this idea of smart manufacturing as we go through the slides today. And according to NIST, the definition of smart manufacturing systems is smart manufacturing systems are those that are fully integrated collaborative manufacturing systems that respond in real time to meet changing demands and conditions in the factory, in the supply network, and in customer needs. Um, I put up some implications of what this means here. So as mentioned in the definition, they are adaptable to changing market and supply. Uh, they also allow enhanced control and analysis by factory personnel and enable some cognitive offloading from human participants. Uh, some of the tools that we're going to talk about today that enable smart manufacturing, cloud computing, and virtualization, you can find these on your formula sheet again, or not formula sheet, uh, terminology sheet, excuse me. Computer Numerical Control, or CNC, Computer Aided Manufacturing, or CAM, and Connectivity for Data Acquisition and Analysis. This image here on the right shows Mazak's iSmart Factory, which is a nice smart manufacturing system that integrates machine tools with robots, and it's all enabled by these technologies. So just keep smart manufacturing in mind. We're going to come back to that a little bit later on. Um, but here's the background of today's, I mean, here's the outline of today's talk. First, I'm going to go through some background information on CAM and CNC. Then I'll talk about the concept for this research, the direct servo controller DSC concept. I'm going to talk about the hardware, the research machine tool, which I brought with me today that I will show. I'm going to talk about software that was written for this work, the CAM CNC interface application. I'll go through some performance analysis results, and finally, we'll talk about contributions and implications. So to begin, let's talk about the background here. Uh, some of you may be aware that in our group at Georgia Tech, we've been developing, along with Tucker Innovations, a voxel-based CAM system known as SculptPrint. So this is a computer-aided manufacturing software that allows for the generation of five-axis machining tool paths. Uh, Sculprint is unique from typical CAM systems in that it uses a discrete geometry for the part model. Instead of analytical models like would be done with normal CAM, we actually use what are called voxels to represent the part model. So in this figure down here, you can see 
The dark blue squares are actually the voxels that make up the surface. This is a 2D cutaway, by the way, but if this was extended into 3D, you can imagine these would be small cubes. Uh, voxel models are advantageous in a number of ways. They allow for us to plan tool paths for discrete geometry that could be gotten from a scanning system. So we can do reverse engineering. We can also do some pretty high powered analysis on the machining process, material removal rate analysis, for example. And throughout this talk, I'm gonna to refer to the voxel size as S, uh, lowercase s shown here. So that will be just the side length of the voxel. And uh, for everyone's information, we're using NVIDIA GPUs or graphics processing units to compute the toolpaths using the voxel model. Okay, so once we've made the toolpath with the voxel model, we have to send that to the machine. And in typical industrial practice, machine tools read something called G-code. Uh, in normal CAM systems, this is created with a post processor, which is a little interpreter that's specific to the machine tool that you're controlling. G-code is a text-based language that was standardized many decades ago, but today it is still the by far and away most dominant way of programming a machine tool. So it consists of uh, lines, arcs, and splines, or other geometric primitives used to make up a tool path, and these are read out of a text file and executed in a serial fashion. Uh, in terms of velocity, with G-code, you can specify the maximum velocity along a particular primitive although you can't easily specify much beyond just the velocity. So there's some, some data flow limitations kind of inherent with the structure of G-code. Uh, here are some examples of industrial C and C systems. The one on the bottom here is an Okuma OSP P300 control, which is uh, Okuma's new CNC system. And up here we have Mazak Smooth Controller, which is Mazak's newest CNC system. So these are proprietary uh, machine tool control systems that read some dialect of G-code that may be partially standardized, which causes some issues with interoperability. So one part program that runs on the Mazak machine can't necessarily run on the Akuma machine, depending on some things. And modification of the control systems can be a challenge because they, again, are proprietary and the manufacturers will typically charge for additional functionality. Uh, they call these options like you would get with a car, so you have to pay for additional options. Um, when we use the voxel-based CAM system to make toolpaths for these industrial CNC machines, we end up with toolpaths that consist, consist of blocks that look like this, this block up here. So when I say block, again, this is on the terminology sheet, but a block is a line of G-code. So here's a line of G-code. G1 means that this is a point-to-point -point movement, and the capital letters here represent the motion axes of the machine tool, and the lowercase letters represent the endpoints of this linear move. So this, this block would tell the machine, move from your current position to the position denoted by the lowercase letters for each axis, X, Y, Z, A, and B. Now, uh, I put A and B here to denote rotary axes, they're not necessarily always A and B, but for this example and with our research machine, it's an A, A, B machine. Now the F command denotes the maximum velocity along the move, and G code is set up so that all the axes must arrive to this endpoint of the move at the same time. Okay, um, now an issue arises with the voxel-based CAM system though, because we create a lot of these five axis blocks. If you examine this image down here on the bottom left, uh, this is kind of a zoomed in version of how we create these G codes. So this shows four voxels uh, set up next to each other. And so we move from voxel center to voxel center to trace out the toolpath along the part surface. Uh, the movement lengths are dependent upon the side length of the voxel as given by these equations here. So in the shared face case, for example, which would be from gray to purple, the movement distance is equal to the side length S of the voxel. For the shared edge, it would be square root of two times S. And for the shared vertex, it would be square root of three times S. Ultimately, we end up with something that looks like this, where the light blue trace is the toolpath. However, when we go to execute this on the machine, the actual realized tool velocity may not correspond exactly to what we did in the F command here. So here's some data that we collected from 
from an industrial machine. And this plot shows actual feed rate as a function of programmed feed rate uh, for each axis, X, Y, Z, A, and B. The black dashed line is a one-to-one -one correspondence between programmed and actual feed rate, which is what we would like. We would like the machine to move exactly as fast as we program it to. Although what we see is as we start to program higher and higher feed rates, the machine cannot keep up with the velocity that we ask it to go. So that's why we see this saturating behavior here. This behavior is caused by the inherent architecture of a CNC machine tool control system. So this image, which is in your cheat sheet, uh, should be the first diagram, is a typical CNC system architecture. Uh, the gray box represents the CNC system itself. So when you buy a CNC system, you don't you, what you get behaves similarly to this diagram here. There are two main subcomponents. There is a non-real-time subsystem shown in green, which consists of the PC front end of the machine tool. So this would be like the human machine interface and the program interpreter. And then we have a real-time machine control system, which is actually responsible for moving the axes of the machine, and that is shown here in purple. When the G-code is read in, uh, these primitives are broken down and sent to what's called a trajectory planner, which is a component of the real-time control system that determines how fast the axes should move along this path. Those trajectories are then interpolated and sent to each servo controller for each axis. I put five here to represent a five-axis machine. Now, you'll notice that outside of this, we have something separate, external non-real-time or non-RT subsystem, which consists of a CAM system and some sort of data collection and analysis PC here. So the CAM system is separate from the machine tool controller, and it sends commands via G-code, but it has no way of getting data back other than some other standards that are just really starting to gain traction now. So one of them that I've called out here is MT Connect, which has become very popular among control builders, uh, machine tool control builders. There are other such standards that exist. MT Connect is one that we happen to work with a lot here at Georgia Tech, so that's why I mentioned it. But the, uh, the takeaway here is that there are two separate data pathways. All right, um, so as I was saying, right, there's uh, sep two separate uh, data flow pathways. There's the G-code pathway for data in and the MT Connect pathway for data out. So a little bit more about MT Connect. Um, MT Connect is used for machine tool data feedback. Um, it is an XML-based standard that defines what the names of different data coming off the machine are, access position, program name, etc. Uh, there are other such standards. There's something called OPCUA, which is kind of used for similar similar applications as MT Connect. And there are proprietary ways of getting data off the machine that will be provided by the control builder as well. Uh, one of the things to be pointed out about MT Connect is in, in typical MT Connect implementations, the frequency of data availability is actually somewhat low. So it will be in the hundreds of hertz range, approximately, depending on the uh, the implementation. And if we want really high frequency, dense data transmission between the CAM system and the machine tool, what we really need is a real-time data link. MT Connect normally runs on the non-real-time subsystem. So we need a real-time data link between the two that is as fast as the servo controllers of the machine are. MT Connect's a read-only standard, so we can only get data from the machine. We can't send data to the machine. Uh, this figure here on the right shows something called Step NC, which is a uh, kind of combination of, I'm sorry, nc.js, which is a combination of something called step nc and mt connect. Step nc is an alternate way of commanding the machine. It is a feature-based machine tool programming language. So instead of having text-based point-to-point movements, we have features like holes and pockets called out here. Uh, step nc is good for interoperability with different types of machines, uh, but, Unfortunately, step in C causes the machine to not only have to plan the trajectory as is done with G-code, but it also has to create the tool paths themselves given the feature geometry called out in the step in C program. But this is a nice project that's being undertaken by some um, researchers in this in the US, and this shows kind of real-time 
data feedback using MT Connect uh, for a machine that's driven by a step NC program. So there are some other alternative, more exotic ways to control the machine, such as kind of high-tech interpolation methods. Some researchers have tried Pythagorean hodograph interpolation or PH, Quintix blind interpolation for jerk-limited trajectory planning and a native nerves interpolator built into the CNC kernel. Some other people have built open architecture CNC systems. Uh, the one you see on the right here was built in France. This is a combination of a Siemens 840D, which is an industrial machine tool controller with kind of a homebrew MATLAB and DSpace based uh, control system here that can be swapped in and out. Other people built native step NC interpreters into EMC, which is the enhanced machine controller. That was a project out of NIST. But some of the main limitations that these researchers call out in these implementations specifically for the interpolation case is these complex primitives are kind of artificially constrained by the proprietary nature of the CNC controller. So you can't really very easily modify the CNC kernel of a proprietary CNC system, forcing people to have to make up their own open architecture CNCs. There's some limited data flow. So in the interpolation case, we feed the curve into the machine the control points perhaps of the curve, but that doesn't necessarily give us a lot of data back. And ultimately this leads to kind of a lack of CAM integration. So what we really want is a tight coupling between the CAM system and the machine tool that will enable a high degree of control and a high degree of data availability. So that brings us to the concept of the research today, which we're calling direct machine tool servo control. So from a high level, what we would like to do is go from a traditional CNC system like the one you see here and provide more control, higher data availability, and increased autonomy to ultimately end up with a system that looks like this. So the purple box shows the integrated CAM CNC system where we have a CAM system commanding a machine tool directly using actuator commands instead of G-code, and then a CNC machine tool that is feeding that process feedback into the CAM system for the purposes of analysis and perhaps optimization later down the road. So this functions as kind of its own autonomous, intelligent, smart manufacturing system where we feed in material and ultimately end up with a finished part. Higher level control comes from ERP, MES, and quality management or QMS systems. So these systems will tell the machine tool integrated system you know, I want this part geometry and I want this many of them. And then the machine tool needs to figure out how to make it. So ERP, MES, and QMS are kind of staples of traditional manufacturing operations. So we want uh, this additional data flow we're going to create in the CAM CNC system to enable easier control from a higher level. And ultimately what the research goal is, is to create a framework for a smarter and more integrated real-time machine tool control system. So for the remainder of the talk, I'm going to show software and hardware that was developed for this work. I'm going to show some experimental motion profiles that we created to evaluate the performance of the machine tool, and then we'll talk a little bit about analysis, and then I'll close with some implications. So trajectory planning is still something that needs to be done in this integrated CAM CNC system. This is done with G-code. It needs to be done with our new control method as well. So what we are going to do, though, is instead of sending geometric primitives to the machine tool controller, we're going to send what are called servo set points, which are constant time samples of servo position for each axis of the machine. This image here on the left shows what I am referring to. So if we begin at this point P1 and we want to end at this point P2, beginning with velocity vector V1 and ending with velocity vector V2, we could describe this curve with a cubic spline, but instead, or a cubic interpolating curve, but instead what we're going to do is actually send the, we're gonna send the servo set points from the CAM system. So these little, dots here represent these tiny incremental movements along the path that we're going to send to the machine instead of sending the cubic curve itself. We need to, rep we need to respect 
the kinematic limits of the machine when we create these trajectories. So we can't go faster than the machine can physically go. We can't accelerate faster than can accelerate, et cetera. And so this delta T here represents this time sampling interval, which will be dependent on the machine tool controller. Uh, this is called the servo rate. I'm gonna to refer to this as the servo rate or servo sampling period or something similar to that. So that needs to be greater than zero because this is a digital control system. It can't sample infinitely fast. Uh, the change in position between two consecutive servo set points over that time interval should be less than or equal to the maximum velocity for each axis. Same goes for the second derivative of those positions that should be less than or equal to the maximum acceleration. And the third should be less than or equal to the maximum jerk. The graph here on the right shows what that would look like for a one-dimensional linear movement. So if we begin here on the left and we want to end up here on the right, we will need to accelerate and then cruise and then decelerate to the final position. If we differentiate this curve, we end up with this trapezoidal velocity profile, which is a typical uh, trajectory planning strategy with velocity v cruise. If we differentiate that, we get axis acceleration and then finally impulses in jerk here. So it's worth noting that this is not a jerk limited trajectory plan. I'm only using this as an example of a trapezoidal velocity profile trajectory planning because that is easy to understand. So uh, in this system, we're actually using a cloud-based time optimal path planning system that was developed for this work specifically based on the references down below. So this trajectory planning algorithm was developed for robotics over many years by a group of different researchers. And we will feed in position constraints from the CAM system, which is the same as a position samples along the tool path. We will feed in the kinematic constraints of the machine tool that we cannot violate. We will fit a spline to those positions, sample that, and then send the resulting servo set points to the machine. Which brings us to the next figure in your handout, which is a diagram of the system architecture of the direct uh, servo control concept. So you will notice that we still have a purple box and a green box as we did before, but in the previous diagram, we had two green boxes. So now the CAM system and the non-real-time subsystem of the machine tool have been combined into one thing, which is responsible for being the machine interface. It is responsible for sending commands to the machine. It's responsible for creating trajectories, et cetera. So you see those different blocks called out here. So path planning, time parameterization, uh, which is creating the trajectories, simulation and analysis, and forward kinematic transformation. I will explain that in a moment. But ultimately what happens is the green box creates the trajectories, sends these set points over to the real-time system, which again is shown in purple. Those are used to populate a buffer, which is then picked off at the servo rate, T servo, shown here by each axis servo loop. So this buffer is constantly changing size, and each entry in the buffer is a five-dimensional vector where each uh, element represents a position command for one of the five axes. Uh, because these are servo controllers, there is some error in positioning, and so we feed that error back into a feedback buffer. This collects data at the servo rate of the machine, feeds that back to the CAM system that is transformed using the forward kinematic transformation into the workpiece coordinate system, which is then used for cutting simulation and analysis. So now I'm going to talk about some of the hardware that we developed for this machine. Um, for those of you on remotely, now that I'm actually sharing my screen, you can see the photos here of the machine. But for those of you that are here locally, I will show uh, the machine because I brought it with me today. So here it is. This is based on a Pocket NC, which is a five axis desktop machine tool that began as a Kickstarter project a few years back. Um, and we have built up this frame to convert this to a vertical spindle machine. Uh, we've added encoders to all of the axes. We've added a closed loop position control system for the spindle. We've added a lot of electrical hardware and done a lot of wiring and packaging to make this kind of an expandable system, um, open architecture CNC system. So this is running off a of Beagle Bone Black, which is this single board computer on top. 
uh, which those of you remotely that sits right here. Uh, this is running on Linux and it runs a modified version of EMC, which is the enhanced machine controller I mentioned previously. And so you guys can come check this out um, after the talk if you're interested. Uh, power supplies <laughs> sit in the drawer down below. Communication is performed on the back. Uh, this image shows a spindle controller, power supplies. Here's a quadrature decoder board we built, which sits here for those of you local. And here is an access encoder. Uh, this image is just the CAD of the machine. So that's the hardware. Uh, a lot of a lot of development time went into the actual software to run the machine as well. This brings us to the third diagram on your handout, which is on the back. You will notice this is a modified version of the previous two. Um, so we had to develop a lot of a lot of software, like I said, in order to actually connect the CAM system to the machine. So the CAM system is not designed to control a machine. We had to build that functionality and enable communication between those two systems. So in this image here, we have a green box and a purple box, which are carried over from before. Uh, the green box actually remains unchanged. So we still have path planning and cutting simulation as we did in the previous diagram. The purple box has been expanded slightly. The technicalities of this are not terribly important. Um, I will revisit this in a moment, but I do wanna point out that we have two new boxes. We have a blue box and we have a red box. The blue box represents a parallelized interface application that we wrote to connect the CAM system to the machine tool. Uh, I say parallelized because there's a lot of things going on at the same time in this interface application. Uh, but basically what it does is it sends servo commands in binary, uh, IEEE 754 floating point format to the machine tool using a TCP over ethernet connection denoted by this arrow here and it receives feedback information over the same connection uh, and then stores that data. It also serves as kind of the socket connection for the CAM system. So the CAM system talks directly to the interface application to get data in and out. And the interface application is what does the work of the machine tool. The red box represents the data collection that was done using encoders. So this is for measuring access position. Uh, these are connected to each axis, and this also communicates with the interface application using a UART connection. A little bit more about the interface application architecture. So I mentioned this was a, a parallel application, it serves as the critical link between the CAM system and the machine tool using TCP. It's responsible for binary servo command transmission and receipt. It is responsible for collecting and storing process data of any kind, whether that's servo feedback or something else. It communicates with the trajectory planner and actually provides these trajectories to the machine tool. Again, trajectory planner is a cloud-based system, so we communicate with that via a web socket. And there is a loopback, local loopback connection to the CAM system that serves as the data pathway from the interface application into the CAM. The image here shows what I mean by parallelized architecture. So this is a multi-process application, which means that if you were to open, I'm running it on Windows personally, uh, some other folks may not do that, but if you were to open it in Task Manager, you would see there's a number of processes running at the same time. Uh, it was written in Python using something called multi-processing, which is a library that enables multi-process application development. And there is a total of six processes inside of here. The machine controller in purple sends data to the machine. The feedback handler in green receives data from the machine. The device interface process in yellow communicates with the quadrature decoder board for the encoders. And the database process stores collected data. We also have kind of an arbiter, which is shown in blue. This is the application controller, which also communicates with the CAM system over the loopback socket shown here. And the main state machine and shared object management is performed in uh, a separate process. So it is written in Python, so you, it can really run on any, any operating system. It doesn't have to be Windows. I'm just using that as an example. Um, also, because this communicates uh, via socket connection to the CAM, we can actually connect multiple CAM systems to the interface application at once. And so we can see data reproduced on multiple different CAM systems. 
When we put everything together, we end up with something that looks like this. So this is a screenshot from Sculpt Print during machining of a toolpath. Uh, you can see the machine model here in green. So that is the rotary table that you can see. The part that we're machining is this gray head here. Um, the tool path is this red trace in the workpiece coordinate system. This is what we've actually machined so far. This plot here shows two dimensional joint space data so that for this is for one particular axis. We're looking at the velocity of the A axis right now. These two plots show the fill level of the trajectory buffer, which is used to uh, buffer commands between the cam system and the machine. And this plot shows the performance of the controller that we're using to control that buffer level. I'm going to show a video that shows this better in a little while, uh, but this is a static image of what that would look like just to help explain the software concept. Okay, so now on to some analysis. Um, we created two example part geometries to test the motion of the machine with. We have a human head model shown here on the left and a candle holder, what we're calling a candle holder model shown here on the right. So these are um, infamous from some of our previous publications that some of you may have read. If you have, then you've probably seen these before. Uh, we made one toolpath, two toolpaths for each part. So here we have a toolpath for the top of the head, and here we have a toolpath for the bottom of the head, and same for the candle holder. So the toolpath itself is shown in light blue, and the uh, retractions or the repositioning or rapids, if you will, are shown in dark blue here. So we wanted to explore kind of high and low accessibility areas, so we made two uh, tool paths for each part. When we look at the data in joint space, uh, what the data we actually collected during a run are shown here on the right. So when I say joint space, what I mean is a single axis position, not in the workpiece coordinate system. So this is in the machine coordinate system referenced from the hard limit of the axis. So just the X axis, for example, can move from you know, positive limit to negative limit, and this is just showing where joint space just means where it is in that range. So this uh, example data was collected during execution of the head top tool path uh, during this time increment between 19 and 22 seconds. So this is a three second detail here. Um, this tool path takes 150 something seconds to execute completely, so I can't show all of the data, but I'm just showing a a small cutout here to give you the concept of what's going on. There are three traces. There's blue, red, and black. Blue is the commanded position. This is what the trajectory planner gives us. Black and red are the actual position and estimated position, respectively. So actual, when I say actual position, I mean as measured by the axis encoders. I mentioned we had encoders on every axis. An estimated position is where the servo controller thinks the axis has arrived. Okay, so a little bit of clarification. Um, I'm referring to these as servo controllers, which is maybe a little bit confusing because these are actually stepper motor driven axes. But the reason I'm calling them servo controllers is because there is some feedback control that is performed on the frequency generator used to create the steps for each axis that allows for some correction and clock jitter on the real-time controller. So there is feedback control, although there's no position measurement per se, which is why we are using the encoders. So we expect that the estimated position and the actual position will match up very closely with the exception of geometric error of the machine. So that you can see is shown here, black and red are overlaid, which is good, that's what we expect. You're probably wondering why is there phase lead between the commanded position and the estimated and actual position. Uh, if you notice, this is about four or 500 milliseconds worth. Uh, this is due to buffering data between the CAM system, really between the interface application and the machine tool. The servo rate of the machine is one millisecond. And so if I buffer 500 points, then I will have 500 milliseconds of phase lead between the uh, commanded trajectory and what we actually realize. So the phase lead is expected, and actually this is healthy behavior because if there was no lead, 
then the machine would be in danger of running through all the points in the buffer and it wouldn't have anywhere to go. The next plot down shows the velocity uh, of this same axis, x axis. And what we're looking for again is correlation between actual and estimated, which we see those are overlaid. We're looking for phase lead, which we see again, blue is leading the estimated and actual. And we're looking for reproduction and shape between these two. So we want these shapes to be as close as possible so that the commanded velocity that we ask the machine to do is actually realized. And we see there is matchup between the shapes here. And down on the bottom is acceleration. And again, we see the same behavior. Uh, there's a, some additional noise. This was numerically differentiated, so we expect there to be noise, but there is shape correspondence between the commanded acceleration and the actual and estimated acceleration. This is here, I can but interrupt briefly. Is, yes. On the previous slide, the 23. Yes. Uh, did you try to register the black curves to the blue and red to understand how the actual positions and orientations differ from the ones that you uh, commended? Yes, I, uh, I will get to that in just a couple of slides. Super, thanks. Uh, I, that was done in the workpiece coordinate system. If I were to register this in the uh, joint in joint space, then the actual positional deviation may be difficult to determine from the registration because uh, this is a five axis machine. So it's easier to look at the data if we do that in tool space. I, I was just commenting on shifting the black curve to, I mean, the blue curve to the right enough to show us the differences and, and uh, was wondering why these are not the same. Why, why, why is there a discrepancy between these two curves since you are commanding exact positions and angles? Right, well, there is some error in creating the steps for the axes, uh, which I'm gonna show here in just a minute. So maybe maybe let me get to the tool space data and then that might, that might answer your question. Uh, so this slide shows the four tool path, uh, data collected for the four tool paths transformed into the workpiece coordinate system. So here we have the head top tool path, the head bottom tool path, the candle holder top toolpath and the candle holder bottom toolpath. Uh, the, the commanded path is blue, estimated is purple, I'm sorry, red dashed, and actual encoder measurement is black. And you can see from a cursory examination, those are overlaid on top of each other. The green dots here represent the uh, where there is positional deviation in tool space. Okay, so now hopefully this will help answer some of the questions about positional deviation. Um, when we transform the joint space data to the workpiece coordinate system using the forward kinematic transformation, we end up with the as executed toolpath as seen by the workpiece, which is really what's important because we wanna know the error of the toolpath. Uh, we wanna know how out the part is ultimately. So here's some example from the head top. Again, uh, these green dots here represent where positional deviation is high. And commanded again is shown in blue. So this is exactly what we want. Uh, estimated is shown in red, the red dash line and actual is shown in black. So you will notice obviously there's some deviation here, but there is also some corrective action that is performed to bring the actual position back in line with the commanded position. So the reason why uh, we have some deviation is because of incorrect step generation frequency, as I mentioned, or really uh, clock jitter in the real time system causes that frequency to be run for too long, which can cause an axis to go slightly beyond where it should be. Uh, so that's, that's what causes the estimated position to be past the commanded position here. The, we can see that the actual position, the encoder position generally matches up. So the encoders tell us there is some error here, uh, but we can also see there's a little bit of places where the encoders don't match the estimated position, maybe a slight offset, which could be due to machine geometric error or backlash or something that the step generator estimator could not possibly measure. So this is why we need the encoders so we can measure what the actual position is. 
So I mentioned here incomplete correspondence between the estimated and actual deviations indicates these two sources of error, mechanical error of the machine and variability in step generation. This table down in the bottom shows the uh, numerical performance of that. So for each, each toolpath has a row, data row in this table, and we have estimated and actual path deviations. We have the maximum and the mean, and then we have the standard deviation of those. You will notice that the actual data are larger than the estimated data. So in this case, the estimated maximum path deviation for the head top is 200 microns, but the actual is 250 microns. And this, again, is because there's some mechanical error in the machine, such as backlash and rotary axis, that would cause the actual position to be different than the estimated position. The mean path deviation estimated is one and a half microns, which is pretty good, um, although the actual mean path deviation is about 50 microns, which suggests there's some sort of offset, perhaps. And uh, likewise, for the other tool paths, the kind of actual maximum path deviations are all of the same quarter of magnitude. Um, so another thing we need to look at is how well the interface application performs uh, can it keep up with what we're asking it to do and be able to control the machine quickly enough? So the image here on the right shows the performance of the trajectory buffer level controller. This is a piece of software we use to control the number of points in the set point buffer on the real-time control system of the machine, which uh, shown on your handout, you can find the set point buffer in the purple boxes. Uh, so we, we want this buffer to be above zero because if it hits zero, then the machine will run out of commands, but we don't want it to overflow because if it overflows, then the machine will run out of memory. And so we created a uh, control system to control this buffer level. We set the set point at 500, 500 milliseconds of data, but what we actually got was about 250 to 300 points on average. So there's some steady state error there. Actually, the steady state error is expected in this case because the controller that we're using to control the buffer level is a simple proportional controller. We could eliminate this or to add in control action. Um, the bottom graph here shows the encoder read frequency instantaneous uh, along this example tool path again. So the blue is the instantaneous encoder read frequency. Remember, these are read by the interface application, which is not a real-time system. So we don't ex we expect there to be significant variability in the instantaneous encoder read frequency, which is kind of confirmed by this moving average, 200 sample moving average. We can see that there's some variability in how fast the encoders are read. So the encoder data is used to validate the estimated step gen position uh, using the interface application. This data table shows the performance of the buffer level controller along each tool path. So for the head top and candle holder bottom tool paths, you can see we maintain the buffer level above zero for the entire path, although we actually did touch zero in a couple places on the head bottom and candle holder top tool paths. Uh, the full traces for this are shown in the appendix of the dissertation. If you would like to see, it just briefly blipped to zero, uh, but it never overflowed, which is something that we also don't want. So perhaps there could be some integral action that would help to correct uh, some of these dips. And now, finally, for a comparison with actual G code programming. So this is what Machine tool operators, programmers, engineers really care about here is how does this compare to traditional decode programming of a CNC machine? We want to decrease machining time. That's always a good thing because that allows us to create parts faster, which allows us to create more money. So the direct uh, servo control system showed a decrease in machining time compared to the equivalent program in G code for each experimental tool path that we dropped. So we ran it directly with the direct servo control system, and we also exported the program as G1s. Uh, I mentioned before the G1s. And we compared the time taken for each of those, and the time reduction is reproduced in this last column of the data table here. So we saw between 7.8% and 26.83% time reduction for these toolpaths. So remember, 
we are creating time optimal trajectories here. We're not using G1s anymore. So this is one source of um, time reduction. And we're also, we don't need to worry about the velocity saturation anymore that I mentioned closer to the beginning because we're not interpreting the program online. We're planning segment by segment in a time optimal fashion. So we can solve both of these issues. And we note that the time savings is dependent upon what is called the path length ratio, which is defined by this equation here, which is simply the ratio of the cutting length of the path to the total length of the path. The cutting length is the portions of the path where the tool is in contact with the workpiece, and the total length includes reorientation, uh, retractions and reorientations. So as the path length ratio increases, we see that the time reduction percentage increases, and this is because these retractions and orientations, there's not much optimization that can be done for those with the time optimal path planning strategy because they are simple linear movements and the solution, uh, optimal solution to that is to use a trapezoidal velocity profile. And that is what's done in the typical uh, machine tool trajectory planner. So finally, some implications of this work, um, conclusions and future directions. So we've developed a system um, that enables these four contributions here. We, we have additional control of the tool trajectory. We can create these trajectories however we want to, send them to the machine over the ethernet connection. We have dense feedback to the CAM system. This is something that was not available necessarily before with traditional machine tools. We have enhanced usability of the machine. We don't need to teach <coughs> programmers to learn how to write and debug G code anymore. They just need to interact with a CAM system. They can press <clears throat> the go button, proverbial go button from the CAM system and run the machine that way. I will show this in the video. And finally, we have shown improved toolpath traversal time as compared with traditional G code. This image on the right is a screenshot of sculpt print showing some analysis where we can look at path deviations here, which is a feature that would have been difficult, if not impossible, to do with traditional machine tools. And for those of you with smart devices, you can actually scan this QR code to see the video, uh, which I'll show in a moment. So these, these four contributions were, were supported by a number of unique uh, techniques we used in this, in this dissertation. So, we have collection and storage of dense process data. Uh, we're storing that in the database, as I mentioned. This enables what we're calling born qualified parts or parts where we have all of the data from the manufacturing process where we can see where did the errors happen if we uh, you know, want to examine a part later on down the line. The data can follow the part through its life cycle. We're creating trajectories using a cloud-based system, CC for cloud computing. And finally, we have developed a fully instrumented research machine tool that I brought with me today. So I'm going to show a video now, um, which again, if you would like to watch it yourself offline is on the back board there. Okay, this is on YouTube. of our sponsors, NIST, NSF, and NVIDIA gave us some hardware for this work. So here you see Sculpt Print. Here's a tool path we've created for the candle holder part. We can click on Control Machine and set this up. No exporting of G-code. Click a few buttons here. We'll connect to the machine. Here's the machine model again. Here is the part. We press Setup. We begin planning a few trajectories ahead. You can see down in the bottom, we're receiving some trajectories in the status window. When we press start, we begin receiving data from the machine. The uh, screen recording was done simultaneously with the running the machine. So you can see that motion matches up between the two here. We have joint space data shown in this 2D plot, planned, measured, and estimated. And up in the top, we have buffer level performance. You can see the visualization running along with the motion of the machine here. So keep in mind, in 
Uh, we are sending commands to the machine while this video is running here, sending commands to the machine, the servo set points, and receiving data back. And the data that we receive back are then plotted in the workpiece coordinate system like this. So we can watch the tool moving along the path. So this is not a simulation. This is actual data here. We can change how much historical data we want to show. Uh, we'll just speed up a little bit here through the path. Um, so the video is shorter. So we're tracing this out. We can look at the velocity as the machine is running for that axis. We can look at the acceleration for that axis. And again, the dark blue lines are the retractions. And now we have completed the path. So we'll disconnect from the machine. And now we have stored all of this data, which we can then go back and analyze and look at where is the error? Uh, were there problems when we made the part? So this is what I mean by board qualified. All this data that we collect from machining the part, we can bring with the part through its life cycle. <clears throat> we can play that back, look at where the tool was touching. The machined volume is shown gray. Joint space data is in this 2D plot. We can look at positional deviation here. We can measure that. Again, planned is orange, encoder is teal, and estimated is yellow. Here's another place where there was some error. And that is it. Okay, so a couple couple pieces of future work I'd like to call out here. Um, we'd like to look at near real-time trajectory planning and optimization. So how can we modify these trajectories using the feedback data we get from the machine tool in order to improve the tool path over time? Um, we'd like to upgrade from stepper motors to servo motors that will give us perhaps some resolution. We'd like to use spindle position control and position um, data recording so we can look and see maybe correlate cutting power with tool rotational position. We would like to add hybrid manufacturing capability and see how we can deploy a system like this to a machine that can both print and cut. Uh, we have enabled a way to do trajectory control for arbitrary trajectories. So we could do material removal rate based trajectory control. We could control the uh, tool velocity based on some material removal rate constraint put into the trajectory planner. We need to look at available trajectory planning strategies on commercial machine tools. So further investigation of available TP strategies. This can be a bit of a challenge because they are proprietary, but we need to understand really quantitatively how well these machines work in all conditions. Uh, the cloud computing system that was used for this work was a uh, do-it-yourself version with a free web socket gateway. It would be good to use something more professional like AWS or something similar. We can integrate additional material handling, robots, AGVs, et cetera. Uh, we can look at expanding the sensing platform. We can look at vibration data, wireless tool tip position sensors, et cetera. And finally, these images on the right show, we are currently working to implement this on an industrial scale machine tool at our shop at 14th Street. So this was a Mori Siki three axis <clears throat> vertical machining center. And you can see one of our colleagues here has built this beautiful electrical panel in preparation for running uh, the direct control system on that machine. Okay, so that brings us to the conclusions. Um, this talk showed an architecture for a smarter subtractive manufacturing system. Um, this system integrates CAM intelligence with machine tool control tasks. Uh, we showed direct read and write of servo loops from the CAM system and kind of higher data availability increased control, 
and an extensible software and hardware platform. The implementation was performed on a desktop uh, machine tool here that I brought with me today. Again, higher control, uh, higher data availability than would be possible with a lot of commercial CNC machines. We have rich motion analysis capability. We can look at as executed motion profiles compared to planned. And finally, we showed a machining time reduction compared with traditional G-code programming. So this really goes back to the smart manufacturing system idea. This is kind of a step towards the print button, so to speak, for um, a subtractive manufacturing system. So we want to create a man smart manufacturing system that allows us to run a five-axis machine tool in a similar way that we run a 3D printer. We don't need a lot of experience. We don't need a lot of process knowledge. We can do that quickly and easily. And that brings us to the end. Um, I can open the floor up for questions now, and I would like to thank our sponsors.